everyone. Um, I think we will we will begin. But thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, I I hope it's all working. I think you might have been here for a while or a little little while longer. But I hope everything's working okay. I'm so thrilled um, to see so many of you choosing to sign in and spend your evening with us, or of course morning or afternoon, depending on where in the world uh, you're joining us from. I'm delighted to welcome you as always on behalf of the How To Academy for what I know will be an absolutely fascinating and illuminating discussion. And um, the book that has inspired our event this evening certainly is those things uh, flashed up in my screen. I'm not sure if you can uh, see my screen, but it is the science of fate, the new science of who we are and how to shape our best future. Um, it's one of the most thought provoking books I've read in a long time. One that really opens our minds to some hugely important questions about who we are in essence and how much control we have over our lives and our futures, both individual futures and collective future as society. And they're questions that become increasingly pertinent as we learn more and more about our brains, thanks to advances in neuroscience. But I'm going to leave all the explaining to the true expert in the field. She is, of course, the author of this brilliant book, um, Science Outreach Fellow at Magdalen College, University of Cambridge. She's been named a top U um, 100 UK scientist by the Science Council for her work in science communication uh, and listed as one of University of Cambridge's most inspirational and successful women in science. There's lots of things I could reel off, um, but uh, I won't. And she joins us from Australia and it's an ungodly hour of the night, morning 3.30, I think you said it is. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, looking forward to our discussion, Hannah. Um, so I just wonder if you could, by, by way of introduction, explain the basic premises of the book, we think of fate as something that's in the realm often of theology and philosophy. And I wonder if you could just outline so that we going forward understand more about this relationship between neuroscience and fate and how in a sense what you're doing is, you know, making sure that neuroscience brings fate and talk about fate back into fashion. Yeah, so um, I actually did my PhD research on the opposite uh, aspects of our behaviour, on brain plasticity, which has been really discussed quite widely um, by neuroscientists, by the scientific community, but also um, it's been kind of held up in the press. It's really been a tantalising idea that we can shape our brains and change our behaviours and quash any bad habits that we might have um, at our will. And, it, and as long as we try hard enough, we can basically shape our brains in much the same way that we can shape our body through exercise um, and, and change our behaviours at will as we want. Um, so I was kind of spending years uh, trapped in a bed, not really trapped, but in a basement of um, the Department of Anatomy at Cambridge University, staring at brain slices and looking at connections in the brain and, and looking at them and seeing how they move and change as we learn from our environment as we, and as we remember new things. Um, and it was fascinating watching the very structure of your brain, the very anatomy and engineering of the brain change as it operates. Um, and, and this whole field of plasticity, so this was about 20 years ago, has given rise to some fascinating results, which I started to feel was a little bit overhyped um, in the press. Um, and I, you know, and to put this in slightly more context, before I started my PhD and before I started my undergraduate degree in biology, I worked as a nursing assistant in a psychiatric hospital. Um, so I, um, it was a very, possibly a strange decision, but I spent a year before I went to university working in that psychiatric hospital. And I continued working there um, whilst I was um, studying, just going back at weekends and, and holidays. And I was particularly drawn to working in the adolescent ward. So I was working with young children who had been sectioned um, and they were placed in this hospital because their local authorities were struggling to, to deal with their challenging behaviors. Um, so we were, talking about some of the younger um, children who had been, you know, they'd tried lots of different therapies, they'd tried lots of different approaches, and it just wasn't working for them. And again, we're talking about 25 years ago now. And I started to think, I started to wonder, you know, what is it about these children? Why are they here in this hospital? Why are they having to um, undergo this, this process of spending their formative years locked in a, in a hospital? Um, and Quite a lot of the staff who worked there um, had also endured similar upbringings and had similar hardships in their life. And yet they were there working as the staff um, and they weren't there 
um, committed to this hospital. So I started to wonder about resilience and whether there was particular aspects that made some brains more susceptible, more vulnerable to psychiatric conditions um, and some brains more, more open to, to having a flourishing kind of positive outlook. And if so, what were the biological components of that part? Because I could see as much as the therapeutic team were working as hard as they could in that hospital, actually, you know, they were struggling and mm. the children there were really struggling as well, some of them. Um, so I, I, was, I, I was very interested in looking at what you can do to shape a brain um, and what biological constraints there might be there within each individual brain. Um, and that's really where this book started. It was an exploration of what, to what degree are our brains, brains plastic and to what degree actually do we have certain biological constraints? And they might be constraints that are our strengths, our brain strengths, and what are our brain weaknesses and what do we do with that information? Um, and, and at the same time, I was very interested in this concept because it's becoming ever more um, relevant to society. So in the last couple of years, for example, um, CRISPR-Cas gene editing technologies have been used. Um, so in China, there was the rogue scientist who was using CRISPR-Cas gene editing technologies on a pair of um, babies, designer babies, if you like, that were born. So he didn't get ethical approval and he's since actually been sacked by his university and I believe is serving um, prison time as well for the experiments that he did. But he um, took some couples that were using IVF um, to have children and used gene editing in the embryos before implantation to um, change some of the genes that were involved in HIV resistance. But what wasn't picked up so strongly by the press was that these gene changes that he made are also implicated in studies in mice. Um, they're also implicated in memory enhancements and learning capabilities. Uh, so, so we're entering this realm now where scientists are able to tinker with the genetic code and we're able to see which genes might or might not be implicated in things like enhanced memory or intelligence or even political ideology which I can talk about a little bit further on but all of these um, kind of very complex behaviors of, of ours we're starting to see how they might have this genetic predisposition to them and we talk about thousands of genes that are implicated altogether um, but we're but we're starting to have the technology so that we can start tweaking and tinkering with that genetic code and then start to selectively pre-implant embryos um, for, for the next generation of babies that might be born. So I think it's a timely um, moment to start having these discussions about how much plasticity we do have in our brains, how much um, biological constraints or strengths and weaknesses are coded into us before birth. And, and as a society, what do we want to do with that information moving forward? Mm, there, there that wasn't very brief, was it, as an introduction? Sorry, Hannah. <laughs> All of it fascinating as the book is and um, there are so, as you say so much of it is deeply relevant to today and I want to come back to a lot of what you just touched on um, you know ethical questions and uh, political questions and it feeds into so much I know that you you were talking about plasticity just then and I think you have um, perhaps something if, if, it, if a screen share works it may not we can move on there's so much to talk about without it but I think you have something to show uh, illustrate that plasticity if you want I do, to. yeah. So this is what I was studying during my PhD. Um, so there's an image here of this. This is my psychedelic nerve cell, um, which I imaged using uh, confocal microscopy. And here's these beautiful little protrusions that are coming out. This one's shaped like a mushroom. Uh, almost, it's, this one's almost like a heart shaped, actually. So this be, might be one connection from one nerve cell um, that's splitting into two daughter connections. And so here, just here, Will be another nerve cell that hasn't been labeled so it's just one of these nerve cells that's been labeled and then dyed in this beautiful pink color and then these different connections that you can see extending out from the nerve cell and each nerve cell has up to 10,000 connections like these these synapses these dendritic spines which allow connection to about 10,000 other nerve cells in the brain and it's through these connections that the nerve cells can form this very complicated convoluted and very intricate uh, neural circuit that allows electricity to pass from one nerve cell to another nerve cell and so allows our brains to process all the information that's coming in from the outside world through our senses and to try and make sense of it and it's through this circuit board that contains about 100 trillion connections within our brain that basically lays the, the foundation the map if you like for how we can think and how we can behave and how we in interact with the world as well and this is a beautiful video of um 
These are proteins involved in forming these connections that are being shuttled up and down the nerve cell. So these proteins have been dyed um, with a little dye and these little blobs are being trafficked up and down the nerve cell to actually eventually reach a place so that they can start making memories. So this is a video of 15 minutes that's sped up and put on loop. Um, so this, is, uh, this, this video really blows my mind. It's basically a video of memories being made in the mind. Um, and what happens as we learn new things from our environment is that we, um, a little connection kind of extends out from one nerve cell, starts to connect up with another nerve cell and forms this um, robust um, memory spine, if you like. And this is where these proteins that are trafficking up and down the nerve cell get um, made and are shuttled around in that we form a nice memory stable dendritic spine, which turns into this lovely mushroom shaped or later on a heart shaped as it gives rise to daughter spines. Um, and that's a memory being made in the brain. And this is going on all the time throughout our life, um, but particularly occurs during the early first years of life, um, which is why the brain expands for the baby as it's growing. But there's a lovely little illusion that shows how this process of plasticity can lead us to um, make assumptions about the world around us. So as we go through life, this process of plasticity actually constrains how we perceive the world because we start to make assumptions based on our past experiences. So from a young baby, as we're born in the world, we're used to seeing faces from the outside world. And so our brain starts making um, assumptions about seeing faces, even when there might not be a face in the environment. So here we're seeing the back end of a hollow mask. Um, spinning round. So this might be Charlie Chaplin or it might be Albert Einstein, depending on <laughs> how you feel. But as we get to the back end of this mask, what you're seeing is the shadows, that information from the shadow cues telling you that it's the back end of the mask. But your brain, because you're so used to seeing faces, sees the eyes and the nose pop forwards. So you're seeing another face materialize from the back end of the mask. There's a more extreme version of this video here. So this is an example of how our brain works against that plasticity and just take shortcuts in our imagination processing um, in order to conjure up our sense of reality based on our past experiences because we're used to seeing faces. So again, we're gonna to get to the end of the back end of the mask here and the shadows are telling you that it's the back end of the mask, but your brain can't help but see another face um, coming forwards. If we now go to another illusion so if you listen to this sentence here. Hopefully you can hear that. Um, so complete gobbledygook to the majority of you. If you now listen to this sentence. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. Now we're going to return to the first sentence, the gobbledygook. And you can see how um, your, oh, I'll stop sharing. So you can start to see how your past experiences of that um, gobbledygook sentence has now been overlaid with the sense of the camel being kept in the cage at the zoo. And it's got a similar cadence to it. And so your brain is using that sense of the camel being kept in the cage at the zoo and overlaying it into the gobbledygook and starting to make sense of that information based on your prior experiences. So for everybody who's just listened to that, um, that sentence, that gobbledygook sentence, from now on you will hear the camel is being kept at the cage at the zoo because of that ability for brain plasticity, for the ability for your brain to use your um, understanding of the world based on your current experiences and overlay that onto how you're going to start processing information from the outside world. And that occurs via these structures, these beautiful structures called dendritic spines. So you can start to see also how all of our experiences and this ability of this brain plasticity of ours, which underpins consciousness, our ability to view, have a subjective view of the world, gives rise to us each having a very unique cartography in the mind. So we each have a very individual cartography based on our past experiences, based on what we've been exposed to in all of the moments of our life leading up to now. And that starts to affect how we view, how we perceive the world today. So our plasticity, and in some ways, actually constrains how we view the world. And that goes on to then affect how we make decisions later on in life. Um, and I want to talk a little bit, uh, if you might have some questions, but I want to talk a little bit about how that um, plays into also how the genes 
describe how that neural circuitry is laid down when we're a baby in the womb as well and how that interplays with plasticity to give rise to our final behaviors in life you, you talk about the developing brain as you say um many of us know uh, you know you describe brilliantly why this age of the brain has made parental anxieties sort of explode because we know now that a lot of that early process when we're younger when we're very young is hugely important to how how you know how our brains grow so how much then is down to innate shaping in the womb our innate shape of our brain and how much can can be changed in those very early years through through parental contact parents talking to their children the way that uh, we are treated when we're very young um yeah so do you mind if i go back to some slides because i've got some slides which really absolutely. help illustrate your this point are, you're beautiful so your slides are absolutely beautiful okay, good so hopefully you can see here so these are the beautiful um images that are coming out of research today showing so this here is a um, beautiful image of all the, the nerve cells in the brain and they've been injected with different dyes um, green fluorescent protein yellow fluorescent protein uh, red fluorescent protein um, these are transgenically manipulated to be expressed in the nerve cells of mice actually in this in case so it's produced a mouse that's got this rainbow it's called like a rainbow color from its nerve cells so we can use that as a dye to start to trace how these nerve cells are uh, being laid down in that baby mice as it's in the womb of its mother and then how it forms this um, beautiful complex circuit later on in its life and you can also start to take those results and see similarly how that circuit is um, kind of formed and, and produced within the human brain as well. And that's something called the human connectome, human connectomage, which is a big field of neuroscience research, which has been um, kind of discovering amazing things within the last decade or so. And one of the results that I really want to focus in on is some results that have been coming out of an uh, EU consortium of scientists that are working across Europe, but I went to go and visit the researchers that are based at King's College London. Um, and they've developed this amazing technology which allows imaging of a baby brain in development as it's in the womb um, of the mother. And they can start imaging that baby brain and see how the nerve cells are starting to connect up and form ne neural circuits and neural tracts and big fibers um, that will lay basically the foundation for that baby's thought later on in life. And they can start to image this process of brain development from a very young age. So 20 weeks gestation, they can get images of this neural circuit starting to wire up. And they're imaging through the amniotic fluid and they're correcting from any movements that the baby might be making as it's wiggling in the womb. And what they're finding from these results and also what they're finding from results, particularly when they're looking at um, preterm babies, so babies that might be born at 33 weeks gestation, so they haven't gone through the whole gestational um, length, is that they can find that there's genes that are linked to certain behaviours and conditions of the brain. For example, genes that are implicated in um, autism or ADHD or even schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, um, we can see that those genes have certain anatomical signatures in these um, babies um, that are correlated with these genes. And so these, these kind of anatomical changes, these almost fingerprints in the brain, if you like, these neural fingerprints um, seem to be correlated with behaviors like um, conditions for autism or ADHD, or even behaviors that might not manifest for decades down the line, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or some depressive episodes. Um, so that's emerging research that's coming out of neuroscientific um, study at the moment. Um, so these genes that I was talking about, um, at the same time as they're being, we're living in the era of the brain and having all these incredible technologies that are allowing us to peer into the brain as never before and start to see these individual nerve cells and start to see how they can start wiring up within the brain. Um, we're also living in, within a, a time that we're able to sequence the 3.2 billion base pairs that make up our very individual and unique genetic code, our DNA, the genes, um, which dictate how our brains and how our bodies are put together. And what this information is telling us is that it's not just the physical attributes like our height and our eye color or even our obesity levels, our body mass index, for example, that have a high heritability, so a high genetic predisposition. But it's also very complex behaviors and very complex conditions um, 
with of the brain that have this high genetic um, underlying foundation as well, if you like. So, for example, for autism, um, and a lot of the studies um, have focused in on medical conditions, because obviously there's a focus on trying to help these medical conditions. Um, so for autism, it's got something like an 80 her percent her her heritability. Um, schizophrenia also similarly has a high um, genetic element to it. Um, but interestingly, we're increasingly finding that intelligence or even socioeconomic status or even ideology and beliefs um, or our resistance to mental ill health have a, a quite a high genetic contribution to them as well. Um, and these are genes that are generally speaking involved in dictating how these genes, how these nerve cells are put together for the baby in the womb, how they're going to start connecting up um, in those early years and how they're then going to go on to function and operate later on in life as well. Um, so in 